Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week I want to share with you some prep work. I'm getting ready to send the rotating assembly of this 383 stroker that we're building for the pickup truck off to the automotive machine shop to have it balanced. But before I can do that, I need to make sure that all of the rotating parts on this engine play well together. That way I don't run into any trouble when I get my parts back. And I'll explain a little bit more as to why I'm doing that uh, here in a minute. But thanks for watching. I've got some other stuff that I'll share with you as well. So let me quickly explain what's going on here. Now before I take this rotating assembly, crankshaft, pistons, connecting rods, and bearings up to the machine shop to have them balance the assembly, I want to make sure that everything rotates inside of this block 360 degrees without any clearance issues. Now we're building a stroker motor here, so this has a quarter inch longer stroke than what this engine block was originally designed to house, and that can cause issue because the big end of the rod is actually moving a little bit farther. It can come in contact, usually it's with the bottom of the oil pan, maybe at the bottoms of the cylinders, and you can also have contact with your camshaft. And I am running a large base circle cam, which makes the situation worse, and I want to make sure that all of my parts play well together and there is no interference. That way, when I get my parts back, there's no grinding or clearancing to be done. So that's what we're going to do. I'm excited to put this thing together, even for a test fit, actually. So let's quickly talk about the connecting rods that I'm using. Now I mentioned in a previous video that I wasn't at all happy with the rods that came in this kit and that I was gonna upgrade. Well, I did, and these rods just showed up. This is a SCAT brand 5.7 inch connecting rod, bronze bushed on the end, free floating on the pin end. Both of these are free floating and 5.7 inches just so you know. This one, the old one, weighs 603 grams, where the new one weighs 570. So 30 grams lighter and probably a considerable amount stronger than the old connecting rod. Now my main concern really with these rods was the fasteners. It came with a no-name fastener, 3 eighths in size. Just didn't trust it. The scat rod came with a genuine ARP fastener which is much nicer, and of 7 sixteenths in diameter, so much beefier connecting rod bolt that I actually trust over one, you know, I know nothing about, can't talk to anybody over it, just, you know, taking a big chance in my opinion. So this being already clearance for a stroker also means there should be no or very little grinding involved for this thing to you know, rotate in this engine without interference. So much happier with this connecting rod. Both are I-beam design, right? This is just a better rod. So the very first thing that I'm gonna do is slide the cam in this thing because I find it easiest to do without the crankshaft in the way. Little lube on the bearings. This is, it's not gonna be a dry fit. I don't like putting parts in an engine or putting anything on one of these bearings that's dry. So, lube everything up a little bit and we'll slide the cam in this thing. Come here, Bobby. Come here. Can I have five? Thank you. Thank you. Can I have another one? Give me a five. Not a party. Five. Thank you. Good enough. Little more. There you go. Love. So you got to be real careful putting these cams in. You can really scar up your cam bearings if you're not careful. And I like to reach through the block. So just find it easier to do with the uh, with the crank out. Just kind of guide it through. Just be real careful. Then reach through the next bearing and kind of pick it up. Just got it, got it home.
So I've got my main bearings in the block. The bearing material is really soft, so you got to be careful. Make sure that they're really clean, because if you set the crank down on any grit or anything, it'll just embed that right in the bearing, and you really you obviously don't want that. So a little bit of lube, because we don't want to assemble anything dry. These bearings do not like that. So now I can just set the crank in. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm changing the connecting rods in this thing, and previously I'd already blueprinted or checked for size and and uh, just irregularities in the old set of rods, but I had not done that yet to this new set. So that's what I'm doing here. Torquing them all down, checking them with the bearings in, comparing that number to the actual bearing journal on the crankshaft to check for my oil clearance, and writing it down. So I'm getting ready to install the timing gear set. This is what we're going to be using. It's a comp cams, keyway adjustable, double roller timing set. You know, just a decent quality setup. Got the roller needle roller bearing in the back. Now this is the factory style, just a single roller, you know, friction style uh, pad on the back, rubs against the cam plate. You know, nothing wrong with these, but I can remember my dad changing these out constantly. It seemed like this a single roller, cheaper budget set like this, one of the first things to wear out on a small block. You know, I know I've, I've changed personally several sets over my lifetime, and I know there's a lot of guys out there who have done the same. So nothing wrong with upgrading a bit and putting a decent set on there. Hopefully this will hold up. And it gives us the ability on the keyway here at least to adjust our timing. Now this is just a mock setup. We're not trying to put things on permanent. Just want everything lined up the way it's supposed to be. That way I can make sure that it all plays together nice. Yeah. Not too tight. Not too loose. It'd be nice if maybe it was just a hair tighter. But that should be a good set, I think. So the camshaft on these rotate at half the RPM of the crankshaft, so just a two to one ratio, right? Pretty, pretty interesting. So there we go, the mock-up is complete, and I just assembled everything as if it was the final assembly other than torque, right, and no piston rings. I just want to make sure that this assembly rotates 360 degrees and that my rods don't hit the block or the cam. Now this block, it came CNC clearanced for a stroker, so it shouldn't have any interference, and these rods are designed to clear a large base circle cam, so I shouldn't have any interference, but always a good idea to check. So we'll spin this thing around. 
360 degrees. Yeah, no problem. No clunking, no contact. That's what we wanted. Mission complete. So there's a little better look maybe. You can see the block has been cut away a little bit right here at the oil pan gasket and we've got a little cut right there at the bottom of the cylinder and that's just to clear this connecting rod bolt as it comes up through there. So that's a lot of stuff, you know, if you didn't if you didn't have a block that was CNC machined, you'd have to do that manually. Not at that big a deal, but still So now that we're starting to get a little bit of nice weather around here, I can get out and film outside a bit, which I love to do. And I figured, you know, why not do a quick little shop update just to fill you in on how how the shop's been holding up. A lot of you guys will remember that's been with the channel for a while that I pretty much tore off half of this building and rebuilt it because it was pieces of it, chunks, were falling, you know, down the hillside into the creek. It was literally needed pushed down with a bulldozer, really. But we fixed it, and I've been more than happy with the way that it turned out. In fact, it's been so much better than I expected that it would be, both for the way that it handles cold weather, the way that, uh, you know, just the, the lighting, the way that it feels, the space, because I've got so much extra space now, because literally I was working in half a building, because the floor was canted over five degrees. Um, on this side and it was really just unusable other than storage. So one more support or lift point to put in. It's going to have to go from right in this area here where that pad's all heaved up up to that truss right there. So I'm definitely trying to take it careful. Watch this whole wall. Hopefully you can see that. That's how sketchy this really is. Put up a tarp it's supposed to rain the next couple days so i picked up this tarp it's a 25 by 53 foot just a light duty tarp they're expensive um, and that's going to hang all the way down the side of this building so i'm going to be tacking it across the top and it'll hang all the way down that way rain doesn't blow in and my workspace stays dry Come on. Come on. What are you doing? Come on. Right there. Hmm. No. No leaks in the roof. That worked out great. Gutters have been working out great. And my drainage across the driveway has been, you know, no problems at all. No clogging or anything like that. So the shop has been a complete success in my, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, I don't have anything bad to say about it. I want to show you the siding because we've had that up for a little while. We'll get a quick look down the side of the building. I also want to fill you in on our bank reinforcement that we did... Um, you know, probably middle of the repair of this building, we had some erosion issues big time on the creek bank that this building sits on, and that's not very good for long-term structural stability of this building. So I stacked up the rubble from the old concrete busted up floor and wired it up with some uh, galvanized fencing wire. And I want to give you a little update on that because it's, that is one area of all of this that I have had a little issue with. So let's walk down in the creek We'll look at the siding first, and I'll show you the problems that I'm having with my bank reinforcement. Although this siding was a ton of work to put up, and to be honest, it was so much work. Had I known what I know now, I would not have put this up because it was that labor intensive. But now that it's done, you know, I'm really happy with it. It looks great, and it's only going to look better as it ages and uh, you know starts to turn gray and black. Really happy with the way 
you know, it all looks and it's holding up really well. You know, no issues, no bulging of anything to, you know, of any problems anyway. We Wood does move, but, you know, so far it's holding up really good. Let's go down here and look at the bank reinforcement that we did. So there's a look at my bank reinforcement. Now I knew this would require, you know, probably yearly maintenance. That was what I assumed, but it didn't cost me twenty or thirty thousand dollars like a big legit wall here would cost as well. There's really no access for equipment in here, so this was the best I could come up with with the stuff that I had on hand, which is just busted up concrete from the old floor, some old heavy galvanized fencing wire, some one inch. Uh, steel rounds that are I think two foot long drilled holes down into the bedrock and epoxied those in and then welded that uh, strip of steel along the bottom to hold that wire in tight and it's done a just fabulous job I've had no erosion issues at all uh, with that area and I've had water up over top of it coming down through here like you wouldn't believe this creek gets uh, you know pretty intense so there's a little better look at this ledge that's about I don't know, eight inches, maybe 10 inches deep. This was one flat layer of stone across through here and the water's eroded it down that far just within the last year or so. So it's chiseling away at uh, the foundation of my reinforcement here, which you know, eventually will have to be redone. But so far it's held up pretty good. Those stakes that I drilled in and epoxied have kind of held it all together. Plus I poured a little bit of concrete in here as well, you know, to kind of solidify things and then this wire is actually anchored down inside of this big puddle of uh, of stone with stainless steel braided wire or stainless steel rope so it's done pretty well you can see all the uh, leaves and stuff that have been caught in here this was just the last flood how deep that gets and i've seen it several times be quite a bit over top of this and coming down through here at just a crazy rate so one real concern of mine, and I need to take care of this pretty soon, is that uh, the leading edge of my wire has pulled loose. This is the upstream side, so water comes down through here and it just wants to tear all this off. And it easily could if a tree or something got caught in this. So very soon I'm going to have to re-anchor this back to the hillside. It's not easy to do. There's not a lot to, to anchor it to, uh, but you know... It held up for quite a while. I'll do the same thing that I did before, or maybe if I can come up with a little better alternative, I will. But so far, this has done a fabulous job of you know, keeping this bank from eroding, because it was like three feet or four feet in at this point. So I'm really happy with the way that this thing's worked out. So let's take a minute and look at the oil pump that we're going to be using in this small block. Now it's a gear pump. It is a drive gear and an idler gear. This is driven by the camshaft, which drives the distributor, which drives a shaft that drives this gear. And this supplies all the oil to the main bearings, cam bearings, and all the rest of the engine. So when this is turning, it produces a vacuum in this cavity here. It goes that way. Yep. Oil is sucked from the oil pan into that cavity there. It gets trapped in the gear, <coughs> excuse me, in the gear teeth. It gets brought along the outside of the gear and then it gets squeezed out when these gear teeth come together and forced out of the bottom through this hole here to the engine. So these gears are not machined steel gears. They're actually powdered metal, which is perfectly fine for, for this application. They're really nicely finished they come out of the mold like that. But the problems that I've seen with these pumps is that over time the idler gear can gall up and you know, wear pretty badly on on this idler shaft here and one way to try to prevent that is to try to get oil down towards the middle of this shaft where it needs to be because there's a ton of pressure on this thing you know forcing it over against that shaft 
And a way to do that is to drill a small hole. Actually, we'll drill three small holes, 120 degrees apart, or as close as we can to 120 degrees apart, in the root of the tooth of this gear. That way, when they come together, it forces just a small amount of oil through that hole and in between this idler gear and the shaft that it rides on, hopefully prolonging the life of this thing and keeping it from you know, shedding any metal and putting it into our uh, main bearings. So I'm gonna put a hole right here. I'm gonna put a hole right there. And then one directly in the middle right there. So we're over here in the drill press. Got our gear and a little V-block here. And I'm just gonna drill three sixteenth of an inch holes. So there we've got a hole close to this end, one in the middle, and then one on the far side. So what I'm using to deburr the holes that I made in this gear here on the inside is just a tapered stone. Just kind of rubbing it over the hole there, trying to remove any burr that I pushed up. I don't know how you'd do this any other way, really. So I went ahead and picked up an ARP oil pump stud because I didn't get a oil pump bolt with this setup. Now there is our pump and pickup screen and hopefully it plays well together with the pan that I got. But supposedly it should because this is a pickup that is also made by the same manufacturer of the pan that I got which is really neat and I'll show you that in just a second. But this was designed to clear inside of a seven and a half inch deep pan and from our face of the block here we got seven and a quarter inches so we'll have if the pan is seven and a half deep we'll have a quarter inch clearance here plus the thickness of our gasket so the pan that i picked up is just a factory replacement really moroso this is a six quart pan and it has one trap door in it which i don't necessarily understand and i think it's just designed to confuse the oil so it gets down in the sump area and then is trapped and can't get out. Now they make all sorts of oil pans based on whatever configuration you're going to be running, circle track, drag race, and all those baffles and stuff do is direct oil to the places that it's needed. And this is just a basically a factory style. And uh, we are not hitting. So this pan you know, we're not hitting without a gasket, so we'll know we'll be good once we add the gasket. So it should be good. So alrighty then. I am very happy with the way that this pump fits into the bottom of the engine. No interference, right? I know that this pump works with the crankshaft and all that jazz. Now it's time for me to make everything permanent, right? So what I'm going to do, because I think it's probably the right thing to do, and you see these professional manufacturers doing it, is I'm going to braze around this pickup tube so it doesn't have any chance of popping off. Not that it's going to because it's got two bolts that hold it on or sucking air, right? Not the most precision fit this tube into the body of the pump there. So in order to do that, I got to heat this thing up quite a bit. And because there's a spring in here, heating it up would probably ruin that spring. And this spring, like I mentioned before, is for the internal bypass and determines the pressure that this pump puts out. So I have driv driven this pin out, almost out, and I'm gonna pull the spring out. It is a yellow melling spring. And there's a shuttle in here, just a valve. 
blocks off the internal bypass until the spring, until the pressure gets to a certain point and presses it off the seat. All right? Shuttle, spring, pin. Now, this is just a piece of cast iron, and I can clean this up and safely braze on the input or the pickup tube. Yeah, there we go. So this has got some little coating on it. I'm just taking a file, cleaning that off where I'm going to be brazing. Kind of, kind of be a tricky job, I think. Seeing as this is, I mean, it's not super thin or anything, but it's not thick. Not near as thick as the housing that we're going to be brazing this to. So we'll see how well it goes. So I think I'm set up here. First thing that I'm going to do is braze up this little galley plug. Hopefully you can see that. And that was just put in there because they had to drill a orifice for the internal bypass and that's just to plug that up. And the reason I'm going to braze this up first is because my access to doing it after I braze on the intake tube is blocked. And I'm afraid that if I heat this up quite a bit to, uh, to get that tube brazed on, it may weaken this plug's ability to stay in place, may anneal it. So if I braze that up first, it's not going to come off. All right, so that looks pretty good, if I do say so myself. Now it's time to braze on the pickup tube. Boom. Done. So there we go. That looks pretty good. Wasn't going to come off anyway because it's held on by two bolts, but you get the idea. A little extra insurance. I have seen the ones that just press in, and that's pretty much it. I have seen those come off and fall off in the pan. So it gives you some insurance against air leaks, I guess. A little peace of mind. I've also seen people put a little spot of braze on top of this pin that holds in the shuttle in the pressure spring, but I'm not going to do that because in the future I may want to change this out. Plus, I don't think putting a lot of heat there with this thing assembled is very healthy for that spring. So there you go. Complete. Looks pretty good. And it remained flat because I checked it. So ready to be assembled. So now that I got the bypass in there, I'm just going to double check and make sure that it does move. So that is good to go. So I guess that's all I have time for this week. Glad I didn't have any interference issues in this engine, right? 
no grinding involved. So I tore it back down, took those parts that I needed to up to my local machine shop where a good buddy of mine works, and he's actually gonna do the balance work for me. So I'm looking forward to getting that stuff back maybe in the next week. And then we can do the final assembly on this thing and start getting it together. Because it's been a ton of work, I'll say. I'm not a custom engine builder, not an expert in the field of stroker motors, so I've had a ton that I've had to research and learn in regards to this engine to make it all play together, you know, up to this point anyway, uh, correctly. So, looking forward to getting it all together and it doing what I envision it doing. So, thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the little flashback there when we were uh, constructing this build, and that was a ton of work as well. But the whole time that I was doing all of that construction work, which took a long time, I was envisioning days like this when I'm working in the shop instead of on it. So it was all worth it, and I'm hoping that this truck it will be, be the same scenario. I've got a ton of awesome stuff that I'm going to share with you before too long when we start getting this thing together. That will be another learning experience. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever, much appreciated. And I will see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes. Hold on to your dream. Oh, I know you want to scream. Since the day you're born, you're just a flower on your own. Waiting for the sun to blossom Hoping to break through the storm